For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and Carolina is back in action this week in a battle for the victory bell, traveling to Duke, 4 p.m. kick on ESPN2. To preview that game, I'm joined by my former teammate and one of the current color analysts for Carolina football, quarterback, good-looking guy, Bryn Renner. Bryn, last week, without, without cutting corners, was a disaster for UNC when you lose and you give up 70 to James Madison, that game has already been discussed every which way possible. There were no player interviews after the game or during the week, so we haven't had the chance to hear from the guys and how they're handling it. Mm -hmm. But if you're Carolina moving into a rivalry week, how do you go about not letting a loss like that beat you twice now? Yeah, I think the biggest thing you said is, is what are the players going to do now? Um, you were in the locker room, locker room with me, Vip, and we had a lot of leaders, Kevin Reddick. You know, it was a big one. Russell Bodine, Giovanni Bernard, and those guys, and and it's almost one of those times where it's a gut check for the players. And I think it starts in practice, Vip. I really do. I think it, it comes down to personal pride and not carrying over that JMU loss into Duke. You really have to turn the page in college football. And every week's a new week. Um, I said it to somebody this morning. I said everything is on tape, so coaches have weeks to prepare. And if you look at the JMU game, they were two weeks prepared. And it, and it showed. Um, not saying that we weren't. It's just something that you have to do. So I think it starts in the locker room, number one. And number two, the players have to take charge and take ownership of what's on tape and what they put on uh, last week and, and, and correct it. So um, that's the biggest thing is you don't want that loss to JMU to carry on the rest of the season. I don't think our team will do that. But because you have to take the positives as well. Uh, there was good things that I saw. I think Jacoby played phenomenal uh, for four quarters of football for his first time starting in his young quarterback journey um, and things like that. So I think it really falls on the players. The coaches can call plays, but if you once you see you know guys making the same mistakes, we all as fans just want to see improvement. Wallace Wade isn't the most intimidating place to go and, and play a game, but with everything – in this game and knowing what it means for the rivalry with the victory bell and, and the in-state pride, what is it like playing in this matchup? I love it. I think it brings you back to high school. It is really just one of those high school gritty rivalries that you don't want to lose. Um, I remember in 2012, we had a, you know, a, a potential game winning drive and we gave them the ball back with about a minute and 12 and they went 80 yards and scored. I think uh, Connor Vernon had a ton of catches on that night, and but I, I'll never forget that. Like it still gives me, it still pisses me off, right? Like I'm still mad about it. You know, I'm not a competitor or anything, but I remember those games. I remember every single Duke game. We played them in uh, in 2011 and beat them at home. And and you're you're gonna remember the Duke game. You're gonna remember the NC State game. So when you go across town, you better you know buckle your chin strap and get ready for four quarters. And I think that's something that the kids you know on the team at Carolina can really benefit from going into this week. Hey, let's go let it hang. Let, let it let it all out. It's a rivalry game. It's early in the year. Let's go prove people wrong and, and use it as momentum. But, you know, I mean, Duke is – everyone hates Duke. I think it's just – it's notorious that we we can't stand them. And um, and you got to use that as motivation. I know every team that I was on, it was – it was you know, the antennas were up. Practice was very intense, very competitive. I mean, the scout team look was – I, I was always told the scout team, hey, I need the best look this week because we're going across town. It's going to take four quarters of football. Um, and that's what's great about college football is it's truly a rivalry. So guys are going to make plays. There's going to be adversity. Guys are going to make a one-handed catch or fumble or things like that. And and you got to be able to respond. So I'm, I'm really excited to watch it, and I know our guys will be ready. Talking about scout teams, you asked Trey Boston who he didn't want to see lining up across from him on a scout team. It, it was this guy, right? I'm telling you. I remember he used to come in the locker room and used to make him look silly. And he's like, man, I can't go against Vip anymore. Seriously. <laughs> this is this is a interesting matchup for Mac Brown. Duke's new head coach, Manny Diaz, off to a 4-0 start in Durham. Mac Brown was 3-0 against Diaz when he was Miami's head coach. And then Brown fired Diaz two games into – the 2013 season when they were both at Texas after a 40 to 21 loss against BYU. So this is a, a big revenge spot for Manny Diaz. When you're on a coaching staff, how do you think their familiarity with each other affects this game? I think it's very critical. Um, I'll give you a little nugget in 2019, the uh, FIU Panthers uh, went to play Miami in Marlins park. And uh, Manny Diaz was the head coach, and the FIU Panthers upset the uh, – Pause the up. Fighting. Pause up, baby. 
And uh, and so, yeah, it was one of those rivalry games for us. And I was coaching corners at the time and we picked off picked off the quarterback in the first drive. And it was the best night. But we played against Manny's team. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of the end uh, for Manny at Miami. And, and Butch was so excited. So I'm going to lean on how Butch felt with playing Manny and playing Miami, where he started the dynasty, left to go to Cleveland. And so we had a bye week actually before that, that week we played Miami. So it was similar to what JMU had coming into Keenan. And so we practiced all week. And Vip, I'm telling you, it was the best practice we have, best two weeks of practice we've ever had. I mean, we were sharp. Butch was on everybody running sprints after. And we came out with our hair on fire because it meant more. And um, I, I, I think Coach Brown and Coach Diaz's relationship is probably very similar to Butch and some of the assistants that he had. And you want to put on a good show, and, and you know what he's going to do. You know him defensively from Penn State. You know him, you know what blitzes he's going to bring. So you can go into the offense and defensive staff rooms and say, hey, this is you know very common of what he's going to do in certain situations. So as a game manager that you are as a coach, um, you can kind of go in with maybe a little bit of sense of what they're going to do defensively and schematically. Um, and I think it's a huge advantage. I mean, obviously, you know the guy, you worked with him, you know personality traits and – Look, I think everybody, if you get into sports, you, you're a competitor and you want to beat, beat the other guy, especially if he was on your staff previously. Finally, Brandon, you, you mentioned him earlier. I want to end with a positive because I think one of the things we learned from Coach Fedora was you can't just look at games in the vacuum of everything. Everything was terrible. There's there's always players that, that do play well and, and they do deserve their shine. And I want to talk Jacoby Criswell with you. Criswell's 474 passing yards against JMU was the third most in UNC history in a single game. I thought there were some throws that he wishes that he had back and maybe maybe learning more where pressures are coming from. Mm -hmm. But overall, I was impressed with the arm talent that he displayed that was lacking from UNC's offense before he took over because I thought he made a couple of throws that we hadn't seen in the previous weeks. Absolutely. And I said this on the broadcast with Jones. I was extremely impressed. I mean, the grit he showed for four quarters. And, and I want everyone to kind of understand his quarterback journey, right? And everyone's quarterback journey is different. I mean, I sat for two years behind TJ Yates and he had two career years. So I got to learn from a veteran that played a ton of football, had 40 plus starts. And then I had 40 plus starts. Jacoby's first start was last Saturday. And it was a tough situation and a tough environment. But if you look at the first quarter and a half of play, he was really accurate. He was, you know, throwing on time, throwing in rhythm. And then when the game got out of hand, I think every quarterback, especially if you're young and you just haven't had the experience, you're going to try to fit things in because you're down by three scores. Um, I think the only throw that I had a problem with was the one backed up and he threw the interception for a pick six because that made it, you know, I think a 25 or 21 point game with, with three scores before going in half. But you got to learn and grow. And I think the biggest thing that I did as a quarterback was, I took the positives of my game and said, okay, what were my negatives? And I wrote them down. And I said, I don't want to make that mistake. And I think at the quarterback position, you're truly, let's avoid, let's not lose the game for the team, right? Maybe I could have fit that ball in if we were up by two touchdowns, but is it okay to punt? It's okay to punt if you're backed up and you have terrible field position. And people, especially young quarterbacks that are going through the maturation process, they're scared to fail. They're scared to not convert a third down. I had to learn that the hard way. Where, hey, man, it's third and 15. Your odds of converting third and 15 in any type of football, like high school, they're very slim. Like, there's a stat. I don't know what the number is. It's probably, you know, 5 to 12%, I would say. And so cutting your losses and knowing when to check it down and, and kind of just getting out of the situation that may be cause, uh, you know, stress on the defense or the, the, you know, the punter might be backed up. He doesn't want to be in that situation. The good guys that I've been around in college and the NFL, they've done that. And so – Back to Jacoby's game, I was extremely impressed. He made a throw vip from the, the opposite hash, the right hash, to our sidelines with a deep over, uh, about 18, 22 yard over. And he put it all on the money with a trailing defender and playing man to man. And once he saw that throw, I was in the box and I was like, yes. That was a guy that saw where the defender was and saw where the receiver was and put it right there. So accuracy was on display. I think he's only going to get better. I think we also got to remember he wasn't here for spring ball. And in the summer, you know that coaches can't be around. So you can look at the playbook all you want, but knowing the nuances of the offense and what Chip wants, it's a little bit different. So 
let's give Jacoby, you know, a lot of a lot of flowers for what he did on Saturday to keep us in the ball game and, and really manage that situation. But I think he's going to come out and be be on a tear against Duke. I really do. Fox has Tom Brady. Carolina football has <laughs> Bryn Renner. And I like us. I like us in that Oh, match. <laughs> man. I have no Thomas Edward Brady. I tell you that. That guy's the GOAT. UNC at Duke, 4 p.m. kick. Bryn, appreciate the time as always and appreciate everybody that's watching or listening. You're the man, Vip.